<laughs> Good morning, everybody, and uh, welcome again to the R Studio uh, or the R Medicine Conference. And right now, we are going to have a panel discussion talking about how to build up an R community. Uh, sounds like they've done a lot of things with different websites and Twitter and lots of follows. So I'm eager to hear what it is uh, they have to say. That's great. Thank you for that, that Beth. Um, so hello, everyone, um, and welcome to this panel discussion, which is led by a few different members of the NHSR community. Um, I'm just going to share my screen just because we've got a bit of a... Oh, apparently I need to remove a source to, to be able to share my screen because there's a number of people on here. Um, so while that's been done, I'll just do a bit of talking. Um, so just to give a bit of a brief introduction to what the NHSR community is and what we do, um, so it was founded by Professor Mohammed Mohammed uh, in 2018. So he's still a very active member of the community. Um, he's not here today, but he's still very much um, kind of the founder and very involved. Um, so it was set up initially to be able to kind of promote the learning, application and exploitation of R in the NHS. Um, and this is done through loads of different methods um, webinars, conferences. And we've got Twitter, Slack, you know, lots of different ways. Um, and it's meant to provide a platform as well for discussing and kind of sharing knowledge and ultimately to try and find some kind of best practice solutions um, to kind of tackle some of the NHS's problems. Um, oh, I can share my screen now. Um, so I will just share this for you briefly. Um, so this just gives a bit of an introduction to some of our um, kind of resources. So we've got um, a website there, which you can you can definitely go to. Um, we've got a Twitter account there and we've got Slack as well. If you'd like to kind of have a look, find out for some more information, get involved. We'd absolutely love that. Um, and on the right hand side, that just shows you a couple of people, well, the people actually on this panel discussion today. Um, Tom can't actually make it today, but he's very involved in the community and he's been involved in sort of um, organising this panel discussion as well. So he's there. Um, so please do tweet us. I haven't, well, I say that us. I haven't really um, got Twitter. I don't use it that much. Um, but do tweet the other people on the panel. They're very happy to kind of have a chat about anything R related. Um, so I'll just stop sharing that now. I'll flash it up at the end for you as well. Um, so... Just to begin then, I'll, I'll, I'll start with the panel discussion. Um, so I just wanted to ask you, Chris, um, what was life like as an R user in health and social care, would you say, before NHSR? And, and what problems do you think NHSR has been able to solve? Yeah, so before I answer that question, I'll just um, just say something very quickly about the NHS, just for obviously being an international conference. So um, lots of people have probably heard of the NHS. So the, um, the NHS, the cat is still here, by the way. Here she is. Um, so the NHS is very large. It's uh, it's the fifth largest employer, employer in the world, um, but it's made of hundreds of organisations. And uh, I work for one of those, you know, for one tiny bit of it, basically, and all of us uh, do. Um, so we're fragmented between the individual um, organisations and uh, within within each organisation, we're fragmented as well. So, for example, in my organisation, there are three different teams that look at data. Um, so NHS analysts do, we do do lots of really interesting stuff like risk stratification and statistics and machine learning. We do do all that stuff, but we also, as I'm sure they do a lot of um, health uh, context, we do a lot of um, reporting to central government and other agencies, and it can take up a lot of time. And often a lot of that, a lot of that reporting is pretty meaningless. Um, so in the early days, so I've been using R in the NHS for about 10 years now. And in the very early days, a lot of organizations were very reluctant to use R, not because of R particularly, but just because it's open source. Uh, and there were lots of unfounded fears about security and bugs and that kind of thing. Uh, and those, and again, I think that's common to a lot of organizations. And that's actually still going on even today, which is a, absurd really in this day and age when Google have a, an R style guide. Um, there are still organizations in the NHS and elsewhere that are reluctant to use it. Um, the whole culture, the whole culture around R was a lot scary and a lot smaller. So I remember when I started learning, a lot of people would go to the R mailing list, which the old hands will remember the R mailing list. It's notorious to this day for being quite a punishing environment for learners. If you ask the wrong question, um, certain individuals on the list would, would sort of let you know that you'd ask the wrong question. So that was quite difficult. So learning R, I'd say overall in the NHS and, and elsewhere really was is quite difficult and lonely. Um, and it wasn't clear for me anyway, and I think to others in the same boat, that the NHS would ever accept it. So it was never clear that it was a skill that was really going to be valued and used. Um, 
So the NHSR, I think, has given us three things that are really important and have really made all the difference to uh, to me and to the use of our, you know, uh, in general. And they are communi community, visibility and resources. Um, so NHSR gave us a community. I think NHSR is it, it's a fairly small community and it's a fair, fairly novice community as well. And I actually think that's something to celebrate, really. So it's a very friendly environment. We pride ourselves on that. There are no stupid questions. And I think some people who are maybe intimidated by Stack Overflow or some other slacks feel completely OK um, asking questions. And we do have some people in, 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 this, in the Slack. Um, who can certainly answer, you know, the the, the, the more difficult questions. Um, so that's really great. Um, it's given us visibility as well. So NHSR is not just something that was sort of cobbled together by a load of data scientists in hoodies. Um, it's a proper project. It's been funded by the Health Foundation. And so I always tell people that when I'm talking about R, I always say, you know, this is a this is a project. The Health Foundation have taken it on. They've funded it. You know, they're taking it seriously. And I think having that external feedback and that external uh, validation, I think, can really help. Because, you know, the people we're dealing with, we're dealing with IT departments, we're dealing with middle managers. They don't know what R is. They don't care. They just don't want to lose their job, you know. So having that argument is really useful. Um, and the third thing that it's given us, which is more um, sort of prosaic, perhaps, is just funding. It's just um, there are loads of analysts out there. There are thousands of analysts in the NHS. Um, and many of them, if not all of them, could benefit from R. And it's really hard to, for them to, to have the time and the space to learn this stuff, to have a conference, to have webinars, to have training days. And NHSR is, you know, it's not a big funded thing. It's not a big flash thing. And our conference is certainly not big and flash, but it's just about giving enough people enough time just to, um, you know, have a bit of space to kind of grow and develop. Thanks for that, Craig. That that's great. And it really just seemed like the communities help remove some of that fear and just help people sort of embrace a new way of kind of working and, and looking at data. Thank you for that. Um, so, Zoe, I was just going to ask you, um, would you be able to explain a little bit about the foundational principles of NHSR um, and what makes NHSR so special? Well, the foundation principles, um, as I understand them to be and how I've benefited from it, was from the promotion of R within the NHS, but with a bit of a plus to it as well. So it's not just the NHS, it's also the social care colleagues we have, academic colleagues. So that it's actually broader in the scope of who it deals with and also in what, what you can learn through it. But I think what was really key for me was the technical training. I'm an analyst in the NHS, so my main skill set was SQL with some advanced Excel. But having learned R, because it looked really interesting to learn, I found that it was much better for analysis than what I was trying to make SQL do. Um, as time's gone on, I've been sort of learning R along with the support with NHSR community over the two years since it's been um, since it started. I found that it was the community really that mattered to me the most. It's a very flat hierarchy that there's a core group of people who work with us and support us. But we're encouraged to have a voice at whatever level of R or even within our organisations. It's a great way of meeting people outside of your organisation. And it sort of fills a gap within our healthcare analysis areas, like you have for our ladies and um, minorities in R. We have that kind of tendency too, but it's also just because we have such a small, quiet voice within the world of analysis. And I think for me, although R is technically really, really interesting and so cool to learn, it's also the grouping that the people that you have around who help and teach you what they know. No, thanks for those insights, Zoe. And like you say, I think I think that strong sense of community has been a really key driver in kind of allowing the NHSR community to achieve what it has done so far. I think that's a really good point. Um, so that leads me quite nicely onto the next question, which is for Anastasia. Um, so I was just going to ask you, Anastasia, about the key sort of what the key projects and successes have been for NHSR so far, um, and what else is planned for the community. Oh, it's a great question, and it always makes me very uh, proud, I guess, of our community and of all analysts in the community. So we are two years old, and so far we had quite a lot of um, events happening. All of the all of our events are free, and again, thank you to our founder, the Health Foundation. Um, so far, we have run 11 two-day training sessions. Uh, topics were absolutely varied from very broad sessions such as forecasting canar to very medicine-specific, such as analyzing hospital mortality data. 
Uh, we also had run seven webinars. I think, Alicia, you mentioned them as well. Uh, in January, we couldn't expect that the whole world would go virtual, but here we are. Um, so it was very, uh, very well received by our community as well. Uh, we also had two conferences. Our last conference was booked in uh, two or three hours. Uh, so we had to extend it. And our last year conference uh, actually ended up being over two days. And uh, we had about 300 participants. So we ran workshops. Again, there are 30 workshops on very different topics, such as functional programming or segmentation. Uh, we also had almost 30 talks and about 10 keynote uh, sessions, including sessions from our studio representative. Um, so you can see we did a lot. And at some point we realized we can't do that much with our small kind of core team. And uh, that's why we came up with the idea of creating a train the trainer course. So we trained other people to deliver training in introduction to R to their local groups. Uh, again, it was before coronavirus and before uh, we actually think that uh, all training would go virtual. So we trained the staff people and uh, I think about half of them already uh, run some training in their area, either virtually or face to face. And we are planning to do the same thing with Shiny in due course. Uh, I'm also quite, quite, I want to say that we are very successful in our communications, though I mentioned this before. Uh, we, are, we have Slack, and Slack is very active, and we have people coming and asking questions. We have our Twitter, um, about 2,000 followers, not possibly too significant number for big organizations, but for us, uh, it's very, very uh, great achievement. Um, we also have, uh, have been working with RStudio a lot, uh, which I think can be counted as a success for us as a small uh, non-profit organization, so we're working Together to build uh, NHS R Academy offer, and we're also working together to um, on our Studio Cloud, and we use our Studio Cloud a lot in uh, in our training sessions. And also, there are all these small things um, which were difficult to count, but which are the most important ones. So we have, we are helping people a lot. And uh, a few weeks ago, uh, for example, we had a very nice message from one of clinicians in the, uh, in, the in the one of the NHS hospitals who said how. Uh, how helpful our community was and how thankful he is that there is a Slack where his question to answer it. So he managed to uh, create quite uh, interesting report about coronavirus cases in his local hospital and present it in R rather than do it by Excel. Um, so it's reproducible and much, much uh, easier, I guess, for him to do. Um, and speaking about which successes, we still have a virtual conference. Um, planning for this November. Now the bar is very high with our medicine conference, so we'll have to do a lot of, uh, I guess, uh, trying to catch up with the amazing um, conference which is running right now. Uh, we're also planning to uh, do hackathon sessions. Uh, we are hoping to create better collaboration between local R user groups and our ladies. Uh, we're also working on creating NHS uh, R solutions, uh, so it's certain packages which would support clinicians and analysts in the NHS, such as funnel plot package or package for analyzing text data. Um, so yeah, lots of work to do. Uh, and this, uh, I guess, main points from me. Thank you for your question, Alicia. Thanks for that, Anastasia. Like I say, it's quite amazing to look back and think how much we've actually done and achieved in sort of the time that NHSR has been running. It's amazing. And there's a lot of exciting things to come, which is always, always something to look forward to. Um, but as we know, these sort of things and, and managing a community, it can be difficult. Um, so my next question um, was going to be for you, Chris. Um, so what challenges do you see NHSR facing um, and how do you think the community can help sort of change or correct some of the mistakes that might have sort of been happened in the past? And how can we make, uh, make sure that we can sort of face new challenges in future? Yes. Well, just before I answer that question, I just want to say that um, the, we, the, this was originally going to be Tom, so it's not that I bullied everyone on the panel to give me extra space. This, I'm, I'm being Tom for this bit. So um, just to uh, make that point. Um, yeah. So I think the thing about um, the thing about NHSR is obviously I'm very positive about NHSR. I think we're very much at the beginning of our journey as a community, but also I think a lot of us are literally at the beginning of our journey as uh, 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 of our journey as our developers. Um, 
And as I mentioned before, I think that could be a strength, but uh, it does lean towards beginners intermediates. And I think we maybe need to grow a bit more expertise to have people with a depth of knowledge. So we have people who can answer like deep player questions. We can have people who can do that kind of stuff. But I think for the real, you know, experts on in a particular area, I think we're still lacking that. And that's something that we can build up over time. Uh, and that's, you know, that's part of our role, I think. Um, I think that's particularly true when you think about um, it's sort of as it's mirrored in the NHS. So um, as I mentioned at the beginning, although the NHS is very large, it's made of lots of little things. And some of those organizations have only got sort of one or two analysts. So they, they, they find it very hard to, to draw on the expert knowledge. And that's that's I think fragmentation it, it, between and within organizations is something that I talk about a lot. And it's I'll be talking about it later uh, um, it, in a couple of hours time, actually. Interesting enough, if anyone wants to come to that. Um, so. I think as a concept, we've got quite a narrow focus. So I, I've said pretty much from the beginning that we, we call ourselves NHSR, but I think more well, rightly we should be called uh, N Health and Social Care and NHS and R and Python and Julia and other programming languages. But obviously that's a mouthful. Um, we do have some Python programmers uh, in the group and, you know, and within the Slack. And we try and be very, uh, you know, welcoming to Python and, and have something to, to, to talk about. And I myself am learning Python. Um, but I, I, I haven't pushed that agenda so much because I think um, when people are learning, you know, you bring someone into a Slack workspace and they're starting to learn R and then suddenly you're throwing a different programming language at them. I think that's probably counterproductive. Um, so we're on a journey with that. We don't have any Julia users at all in the Slack group. And I keep encouraging you. I want someone to go off and learn it. So because I don't have to, basically. But that's what I think would be really positive if we if we had some people doing that, too. Um, I think something uh, else that we need to do is think about and this is, again, something that's a sort of like a general thing in in, in the world of analysts is kind of um, soft skills and influence and that kind of thing. NHSR, as we've mentioned, is a, is a grassroots thing and it has a lot of community and it's a flat hierarchy. And those are all things to celebrate. But I think we also need to get better uh, as individuals and as a group at kind of punching above our weight um, in, you know, strategically in, in you know, in, in regional groups and, you know, that kind of thing and having influence at that kind of level. Because I think although what we, we can achieve a lot with what we're doing, I think you can achieve even more if you can get your voice. And I think we have been doing that. I'm not saying that we haven't, but I think that's somewhere where we can grow. Um, we have NHS branded projects underway. And again, some of those are quite in the early stages. I myself am working on something uh, and it's in the early stages, partly to be honest, because I've just been too busy doing things. Um, and I think that's part of the other problem as well is that um, NHSR, it's not a legal entity. It's not an organization. No one works for NHSR. It's just a group of people who've come together with similar interests. And so it's very hard for us to kind of get things off the ground. So although we have money and we have allocated funding you know, to projects, the people doing those projects, like, for example, me and others, have got other full time jobs to do. So so fitting it all around um, can be challenging. And that's a real shame. But that's you know, that, that that's the nature of the beast. That's what we're working with. Um, the other thing on the subject of funding is that um, it's possible. I don't know. The funding is only for a certain amount of time. It's possible we might one day need to adapt to being an organization with no funding and being effective at that. Uh, in that way. And I think we could do that. And I think that's something, again, something to celebrate. Um, because as Zoe was saying, it's, it's about, you know, the philosophy and the community. And it's, it's about that. But I think having a bit of money, you know, to pay for sandwiches and pay for conference rooms and stuff is also really important. So that's something that we may have to face uh, in the future. Um, I was going to say more, but that's, uh, yeah, I think that's probably, we'll probably run into time, aren't we? So I'll hand over now. <clears throat> and thanks for that, Chris. And like you said, there's, there's always going to be challenges, isn't there, in, in anything that you do. But I think we've got some really talented people and passionate people in the community and a, and a really driven, passionate founder in Mohammed. So, you know, there's ways, ways and means. There's always things we can do better. But I think we've we've achieved quite a lot so far. Um, I don't know if there are any specific questions that people wanted to um, to ask. Um, but if any... Oh, yeah, I could just see Beth put, um, put a note in there um, that I can see. Um, but in the meantime, I don't know if any of the panel, if there's anything, in it, you know, anyone else has said that you wanted to respond with, ask any kind of final thoughts. Um, Anastasia, I don't know if you've got any any kind of final comments. 
Uh, yeah, I'll just quick look in the chat and uh, thank you, Richard, for posting a link to, the, uh, to our conference. Yes, registration is open. Um, if you want to register, you're very welcome. Um, yeah, we likely will have morning sessions and also afternoon sessions. Um, so hopefully we will be able to accommodate uh, people from all over the world. Um, and uh, yes, thank you everyone for your nice comments as well around community and for people who wonder if they need to join somehow. We don't have any like any booking or anything. You just come over to our website, follow us on Twitter, um, join our Slack, ask questions if you want, and uh, hopefully we will be uh, helpful for you and we can all work together from different parts uh, of the world. So this is all I want to say. Thank you. Thank you for that, Anastasia. And I can just see Beth's put... Um put a question in there if any any other panel would like to answer that. Um, what have been your biggest roadblocks? I could talk from my point of view in using R in the community. I, I haven't experienced them, but I've seen others. I think as Chris alluded to, we've got day jobs to do. And if you're already entrenched in a particular program that works like SQL, that you need support still to be able to take that time. People from NHSR will be there and readily give their um, their time and their support, but you still need that time to use the, the, the program, make mistakes. And when you're under pressure, you can't do that. You have to just continue with what you're doing. There's the recognition of it as well, as also was alluded to, that you can do great things, but if people don't understand what it is that you've done it and can't done it in and can't reproduce it, they want you to then go back to what they recognize. So it comes back to the Microsoft products and then and SQL specifically, or something like Excel or Power BI. And I think it's our culture outside of NHSR, is it's just growing in momentum at the moment. It's not the default way of analysing things. So I think that comes with it. And with that is also people's time. Trying to get people to volunteer their time is always difficult. And it's without that support and recognition of, actually, this is a really great thing to practise your soft skills with, presenting your data your, not your data necessarily, sorry, because there'll be some sort of information governance around that, but your code, sharing that, seeing that that's a really worthwhile thing to do. I think that's, for me, the biggest roadblock, although Chris is my boss, so that's not actually there. It's just disappeared. <laughs> Maybe one more question and or finish this answer and then wrap up. Well, yeah. Um, well, I was just going to say something, just picking up on what Zoe said. Yeah, I think... The thing for me, the, the the number one principle of NHSR, it's all about sharing. Like that's that's what it's all about for me. It's a hundred percent about sharing, and that's a, a value I think we've sort of picked up from the tech community. That was that was as I learned R, I, I learned more about that value, and it's really it, I find it very ironic that I work in, in a very large public sector health system um, where we're not encouraged to cooperate across organisations. We're not necessarily even really encouraged to cooperate within the same organisation. Uh, we're certainly not encouraged to share code. Uh, we're allowed to share code if we beg and plead and do all the things that I've been doing to make sure. And to be fair to my organization, who may be watching at some point, they're absolutely great. But there are lots and lots and lots that aren't um, that I won't name. Um, and so I think it's it's that really it's it's the, it's the permission, you know, to, to the, I think it's very obvious that the way we're working is right. We're helping each other. And as I say, I think you could run HSR for free. I think it would be effective. And I think that's amazing, really. Um, but we're doing it sort of, uh, or in the early days at least, we were doing it in the teeth of opposition um, that's long standing about protecting IP and protecting staff time and protecting organizational resources and all that kind of stuff. And it's, that, it's been fly, and it's giving us permission to fly in the face of that. No, thank you for that, um, Chris. That's great. Um, I think, yeah, we are, we're pretty much to time. Yep. Um, so thank you very much, everyone. Um, I've seen a couple of um, people asking about some of the links. So we'll post that in the um, in kind of the chat at the side for the, the website, Slack, things like that. So you've got access to that. So please do get involved and um, join the discussion. Uh, and yeah, thank you very much all. Thank you to the panel as well. Thank you very much. Yes, thank you very much. It was really interesting and I've got some good ideas and uh, we've got a scheduled break right now. So the next session will start at 35 at whatever time zone that is. <laughs>